In this lecture, I'm going to talk about infinite limits, what that means, um, and how we compute them, how we determine whether or not a function has an infinite limit. Uh, the first thing I want to do, though, is talk about a little bit about the terminology and about the notation. So you might see this notation, the limit as x approaches some number c of a function equals infinity or equals negative infinity. Um, but usually, you know, there's two, two issues here. One, this issue with equals, right? How can we equal infinity? Uh, infinity is not a number, all right? So I don't like this, um, this equals notation because it reinforces this misconception that a lot of students have that infinity is a number and we can just, and, and when you say equals, and that's what we do with numbers, right? Because it, infinity is more of an idea or a concept of, of being unbounded. So I like, better the notation, although you won't necessarily see it in your textbook, that the function, as you get close to c on the x-axis, that the function tends to, you know, positive or negative infinity. It increases or decreases without bound. And even this idea of an infinite limit, right, that seems like a contradiction of terms, right? Like, how can it be a limit and also be infinite? Um, and, and so I think a better way to think about it is that how is the function behaving near this point C in its domain? Um, so if, if it's increasing without bound, then we might say that the limit tends to infinity, or if it's decreasing without bound, then we might say that the limit tends to negative infinity. But I think saying it equals infinity or saying that the limit is infinity um, can be a little bit confusing. So first I wanted to clarify that. Um, let's take a look at a specific example of what this might look like. So if I have the function one over x minus three squared. So let's go ahead and take a look at the graph of that. Um, so it's going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals three, which we will talk about a little bit later. So here's the asymptote and Let's just think about what's going to happen here. Let's look at the one-sided limits, all right? So if we take the limit as x approaches three, coming from the left of one over x minus three squared. So if we put in things a little bit smaller than three, but getting very close to three, so for example, like 2.99, then 2.99 minus three would be negative 0.01, and then we would square that, and that would become even smaller because we're taking one hundredth of one hundredth. And then we would divide one by that very, very small number. So what's happening is as we get closer and closer to three, the function is increasing very rapidly. And then when we get farther and farther away from three, then this number here gets large. It'll be a large negative number, like if we put in zero, for example, we get negative three, but when we square it, we get nine, and we have one ninth, which is getting close to zero. So the farther we get away from three, the closer this gets to zero. But it never gets to zero, right? Because one divided by a number can never be zero. Likewise, if we take the right-handed limit, so if we're coming from the right, notice, and it's because of this squaring, we're gonna have the same kind of effect going on. If I put in um, 3.01, or 3.001 or 3.0001, I get, and once I subtract three off, I get a very, very small number that I'm squaring, which makes it even smaller, and I'm dividing one by, um, one by that very small number, which means it's going to increase near three. Likewise, the farther we get away from three, the closer this thing gets to zero. So this is um, what the graph looks like. Um, so here we would say that this is tending to infinity, and this one is tending to infinity. So if the right and the, and the left hand limits both tend to infinity, then we could say that the limit as x approaches 3 of 1 over x minus 3 squared tends to infinity. Again, you will probably see the equal sign in your text, um, but for reasons I've already stated, I'm not going to use that notation. Okay, so there's one example. Let's look at another example that's a little bit different. Um, go with a different color here. So let's look at um, 1 over x plus 2. Let's take a look at that graph. 
So at x equals negative 2, because that's what's going to make this denominator 0, we will have a vertical asymptote again. All right. Um, so if we take the limit as x approaches 2, and we'll come from the, the left here of 1 over x plus 2. All right, so now let's say I'm putting in, if we put in negative 3, we get negative 1. If we put in negative 2.5, then we're going to get negative 2. If we put in negative 2.1, then we'll get negative 10. So you can see as we get closer and closer, um, whoops, this should be approaching negative 2, right? Because that's where our approaching negative 2 from the left. But the point is this is getting more and more. This is decreasing very quickly. Um, things that are farther away, like negative 12, um, when we add those together, we would get negative 10, and 1 divided by negative 10, that's negative 1 tenth. So the farther we get away from negative 2, the closer this gets to 0. All right. So this seems to tend to negative infinity. What about if we approach negative 2 from the right of this function? So here now we're putting in things like we could put in 0, that would give me 1 half. If I put in negative 1 here, then I would get positive 1. If I put in um, negative 1.9, I would get 10, right? Because negative 1.9 plus 2, that would give me 1 tenth, 1 divided by 1 tenth. So we can see this is having the same thing, but these numbers, because, these, because we're approaching negative 2, um, from the right, these this sum will be positive, so this is going to increase. And as it gets farther and farther away from negative 2, it tends to 0. So this one tends to positive infinity as we approach negative 2 from the right. So we can see that, that um, in, in like this case, for example, the from the left and from the right, they both approached positive infinity, increased without bound. Here, the left and the right don't agree, but there, we still call them infinite limits in the sense that the, the one-sided limits exist in the sense that we're, we're approaching some number. Well, not really approaching some number, but we're, we're, the, the function is behaving in a way near this point, negative 2, that we can describe by saying that it tends to infinity. Okay. Um, so as promised, I want to talk a little bit about vertical asymptotes. We've already seen a couple in these two examples. Um, when do we have a vertical asymptote? Um, so let me define this function, h of x. It's a rational function. It's rational, the way I like to think of that, a rational function. is that it's the ratio of two functions. All right, so here we have the ratio of f of x and g of x. And at some point c, at x equals c, f of c does not equal 0, but g of c does. All right, and at that point, um, we're going to have a vertical asymptote. All right, um, you might also say that, you know, if we take the, the limit as x approaches c, um, let's say from the right, um, then h of x would tend toward positive or negative infinity. Or likewise, we take the limit as x approaches c from the left, then h of x will approach so what we're saying essentially is that the one-sided limits near h are going to tend toward positive or negative infinity. It will increase or decrease without bound. And this is when we know that it's going to happen. All right. So I just want to make a brief note here that if f of c equals 0 and g of c equals 0, then the graph will have a hole. Instead of an asymptote. All right.
So this part of it is, this is part of it, but we have also have to have the numerator is not equal to zero, the, whatever the function is. So for example, we saw up here, this always stayed one. So as we got closer and closer to negative two, so if we just look at the bottom piece right here, we know that putting a negative two for x will give us zero. But at negative two, the numerator is always gonna stay one. All right, that's what we need in order to have this type of thing going on. Or likewise here, we know that the denominator would equal three if I put in, sorry, would equal zero if I put in three for x. But at, at x equals three, the numerator is not zero, it's one. It doesn't have to be one, but it just can't be zero. All right? Um, so let's look at one more example of this difference between the whole and the vertical asymptote. So again, the whole would happen when both of them are equal to zero. So you would have a, um, a zero over zero type of a thing, this, this kind of indeterminate form where both of them equal zero. So let me give you an example of each of those. And actually, we can find an example of each of those in the same function. So if I have x plus 1 over x squared minus 1. So one, as I noted before, one way to find the vertical asymptotes is to, is to note where the denominator equals 0. So let's set, take the denominator, and we will set it equal to 0. We can add 1 to both sides. So I get x squared equals 1. And then I can take the square root of both sides or I can just look at it and say, well, what numbers, when I square them, give me 1? And that would be positive 1, but also negative 1, right? When I square positive 1 or negative 1, I get 1. If you want to use the square root, that's fine. Just make sure that when you take the square root, in this case, that you take both the positive and the negative square root. All right, so here is when, where the denominator equals 0. But in order to have the vertical, vertical asymptote, the numerator cannot equal 0. So where does the numerator equal 0? Well, let's set that equal to zero. That's going to be at negative one. So this information together tells me that at x equals negative one, I have a hole in the graph. And at x equals positive one, I have a vertical asymptote. All right, because at positive one, the numerator will equal two, but the denominator will equal zero. All right, let's take a look at the graph of this, and we can also see see these things on the graph. One way to graph this is to simplify it. Because if you have this where they both have this um, at negative 1, both the numerator and the denominator are 0, many times algebraically, and we talked about this in terms of um, evaluating limits algebraically, we can, we can find a common factor that we can cancel out. So let's factor the denominator. And x squared minus 1 factors into x plus 1 times x minus 1, so those we can divide out, but, well, so we get 1 over x minus 1, but for, we can't forget, though, that the, the function is still undefined at negative 1. Just because we could divide this out doesn't mean all of a sudden this is actually our function. This is our function, but um, it's, it's our function when x is not equal to negative 1, all right, because the original function is still undefined at x equals negative 1. So this isn't exactly the same as 1 over x minus 1. It's the same everywhere except right at this point. All right, so let's take a look at the graph. We know we have a vertical asymptote at positive 1. So let's go ahead and sketch that in. We'll call that positive 1. And then at negative 1, so this, we'll call this 1 and negative 1. At negative 1, we're going to have a hole. So what does this look like? Well, it looks like 1 over x, except it's shifted over 1 to the right. So 1 over x is going to look like this up here. And then down here, it's going to come down. So let's just go ahead and draw our hole in here, like this. All right. So again, this is just to emphasize the difference between when we have a vertical asymptote and how to find it, and when we have a hole and how to find that. All right, so that is it for infinite limits.